Om Shanti, everyone. Welcome to America Meditating Radio and The Next Normal. I'm your host, Sister Jenna. We continue to look at this period in our lives as an opportunity for us to see what is our call. You know, many of us are getting called, but we're so distracted or we're so into playing life safe that we don't respond. Just before coming on air today, I was thinking something so deep. There's a group here called the um, the Sheng Young Dynasty. It's a dance ensemble that performs at the Kennedy Center and around America. And they use the Falun Gong um, philosophy. And for some reason, it came up in my consciousness today because they sent me an email. And it was about them knowing that there's a golden age coming and that the world is in an iron age state, we have to get over it, we can't keep allowing suffering and darkness to prevail. And I was thinking about my own spiritual tradition of the Brahma Kumaris, and I said, you know, we have the same notion too, you know. And, I was, and, and when I look at all my friends around the world and all the religions and, and cults and groups and organizations and institutions that I'm so friendly with, I don't judge anyone. I was just realizing, you know, it's all the same. Just where are you most comfortable? What gives you comfort? That you feel that you can grow, you can thrive, you can build great relationships, great friendships. And I think that happens to a lot of us, you know. We're moving along and we're just having this thought, you know, who am I? Where do I belong? What is this about? Our special guest tonight is about this, Kurt Davis. Kurt is a te technology entrepreneur, mindfulness expert, and social impact worker. The first 20 years of his career were spent between Silicon Valley and Asia, working on technology startups in finance and business development roles. But in 2017, he took time off. Can you imagine what he was going through inside? He took time off. He traveled to good old Africa. He began to volunteer at many emerging business accelerators and nonprofits. But witnessing that entrepreneurship gives people hope, Kurt started Kakuma Ventures to empower and finance local entrepreneurs in the Kakuma refugee camp. His experiences are documented in his book called Finding Soul from Silicon Valley to Africa. Please, let's welcome Kurt Davis to The Next Normal and America Meditating Radio. Kurt, very warm welcome to you. Let's get right into it. What an incredible journey. You just went away, you know. Uh, what was it that pulled you into Africa? Was it something that you kept wanting to explore when you were a young chap? Uh, no, I, I've always had a little bit of a travel bu bug and... Uh, early in my career, I was able to live in Asia, Japan, and Hong Kong, which set me on a path to, uh, and I also spent quite a bit of time in India to like explore the world more. So I set a very young goal at a, a young age, a uh, goal at a young age to try to see 100 countries. Um, and I did that while working uh, to fund a lot of the travel. And so when I hit this crux in my career, I decided, well, what is it that I'm searching for? Like, and I didn't really know. And um, I decided that like, I would pursue that goal that I made when I was in my young, early twenties to see a continent that I hadn't seen, which was Africa. Uh, and I would uh, go spend time there. Now the news at that time, there was a lot of, there was a, more and more news coming out of Africa about startups. I had a friend who was working at a startup incubator there. I was working with another nonprofit called Team for Tech, which was doing work out there. So I had some friends who were doing more and more work in Africa. And so that gave me a segue uh, or a landing uh, pad to go there and to do things, which is I like to, when I travel, I like to do things. I just don't like to, to like walk around and, you know, that's fun too, walking around and talking to local people. But, uh, but you, if you spend ample time somewhere, you want to, to immerse yourself and get to know people and their cultures. And so um, I, uh, threw caution to the wind and said, I, uh, you know, I didn't have any uh, things holding me down. So I went for it and uh, it took me on a journey and I let the journey take me. I, I didn't, I didn't fight it. I let the universe 
guide me through um, the places I went and people invited me into their homes, into their nonprofits, into their accelerators. And the way I gave back and the way I'm trying to give back to them for their hospitality is to write the book about it, to let others know that these organizations exist, these people exist, uh, these do-gooders trying to make the world a better place exist. And maybe somebody will read it and decide they want to, to help them out and to, to go there and experience something that I experienced. So yeah, that was Wonderful my story. gift to them. Wonderful. Just this morning, I was talking to someone whose, father's, whose father runs a village in India and his wife just passed away. And he's taking his money to build something in the village. And I told her, why doesn't he find something that can generate revenues for the villagers, you know, instead of just build something and they sit on it. So I appreciate your forward thinking in helping to see in what way we can bring hope into people's lives when they might be in conditions that seem a little bit hopeless. So as you were walking the streets of Africa as this Caucasian man, did you sense anything that was quite unique and different? I mean, was there something happening inside of you that was like a soul awakening? Um, I, the kind of the climax of the narrative of the manuscript is, uh, I was in Uganda, it was 2 a.m. And I was going to Uganda to run a marathon, actually. The Uganda Marathon is a fairly popular race for both foreigners and locals. As you know, the Ugandans and Kenyans love to run. Uh, they're the, some of the best runners. Um, and I uh, was a little disheveled. I got off at 2 a.m. I was hungry. Uh, I, was, I was dehydrated. And there were a bunch of people around and they had their motorcycles and you know, there's a ruckus, the normal ruckus. And, and people like, you know, in some of these developing countries, like they stay up late and they just, they're doing their stuff, hanging out with their friends and just, just, just living, right? And I got a little scared. I was like, you know, I felt this fear inside of me. And some of these, some guys approached me, and and then um, his his answer was, "Would you like some water?" And I was like, "Yeah, I would love some water." <laughs> wow. And uh, he's like, "Well, sit here. Put your backpack down. Sit here. We'll get you some water, and we'll get you a ride to where you need to go." And it hit me. I was like, "Oh my God!" Like, he's just. He just saw me as a soul who needed some help. And I didn't, I was, I had this inclination of a little bit of fear and I didn't, there was no reason to, but I think, you know, it was that natural instinct or whatever it came from. And I, he saw me as someone who needed help. And, and I realized, Hey, if I could see the world the way he saw me, um, maybe my perspectives on how people change. And then from that point, everywhere I went, whether I, I really kind of went to refugee camps after that, I pushed myself and I just said, look, this is just a soul trying to make it in the world who needs, who needs someone to see them as they are and to try to empower them. And, uh, you know, I did my best and I'm, you know, the little I can with what I have and we're still doing it and we're still doing more things. And, and uh, yeah, that was it. You, you just put a tear in my eye with that story. Yeah. Because it's so interesting in the United States of America, you know, this publicity campaign that we have where, you know, folks with a little bit darker color skin, you have to lock your door, wind up your windows, be very, very cautious about them. And here you are in the motherland where they were before they were transported. And you get off of a bus, you're disheveled. And that brainwashing of what we were told, you know, about particular cultures it still has lingering effects on our interpretation. And that moment in time for your life where the guy just goes, you need some water? Just take it easy. You're like, you get it, sometimes it confuses you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, so what, what, what I was told back home is not right? Really, these are humans, these are good people? <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about your book. Um, you refer to your book, Finding Soul from Silicon Valley to Africa as a travel memoir your spiritual journey, your self-help book all in one. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about the book and why you chose to write it? Why I wrote it, the real reason why I wrote the book was because it was a, it was a way to give back to those who, who hosted me and gave to me and I wanted to find a way to help them. That was the real reason. And I, in hopes that other people would read the book and maybe connect with them at some point. Um, 
So it'd be a kind of a conduit, you know. Um, the other reason why is I wanted to share the experience that many other people would never get to, to the power of travel, the power of immersing yourself in another culture, the power of these different experiences that meant a lot to me personally, that, that I really learned from them and, and it changed me kind of inside and out that I would say, hey, look, you can't experience this, but if you can see what I'm experiencing, maybe you can take bits and pieces of it. Uh, and, and, and to the culture, you know, primarily focused on US, right? Primarily focused on younger people, uh, people are in their careers who are looking to travel, looking for experiences, looking to see the world in a different way. Um, and that was my real reason to write it. Uh, and uh, I started off blogging a lot of, of a blogger, I have a big blog. And, um, and you know, he said, like, why do you blog? Isn't that so 1990? And I'm like, yeah. Just do things that you like to do. Why do you have to do things for a purpose? You know, I do things that 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 satisfy you. So I was blogging, blogging, blogging. And then I went to, I put all the blogs together and I said, okay, well, this could be a book, I guess. And then I read all the blogs. And I was like, this is a really bad book. <laughs> like no one's going to want to read this book about some white dude running around Africa. Right. By the way, some, some, one publisher told me that when I was trying to get it out. I said, nobody wants to read about a white guy going to Africa. Okay. So like, so what did you learn? And tell us about like that refugee camp experience. Like that sounds really cool. And that, what are you and the re guy in the refugee camp doing? And so I was like, I had to dig, right? I had to really dig out of me what the experience has meant. So it took me quite a bit of time and with some editors to really, they, they were really extracting out of me. What did that mean to you? What, what, how did it change your perspective? How do you see the world differently? And I had to pull all these little things out of me and then say, yeah, actually that's what that experience taught me. And so that took almost a year to actually start putting that in there and then, and then uh, putting it together. And then uh, lo and behold, the people who I visited um, edited their parts and also did the audio book. So 40 of them are in the audio book and they've done their, done their dialogues with me. So, yeah. I need to sink into it. So, you know, what in the book you think or what area in the book can help us to understand the roots of racism and perhaps erase racism from our consciousness? I think um, there's, a, there's a guy I met along the way um, named Toto, and he's this really interesting German guy who ended up in Africa. Uh, was a big Vipassana guy as well. And as we connected through that, and he's like, oh, you just did Vipassana and you ended up in Africa. He's like, well, I just did Vipassana and ended up in Africa too. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but he builds nonprofits. Like he, he ended up at this place uh, where this lady hosted him on couch surfing in an orphanage. And he decided he was going to stick around for a year and build, uh, build, help her build the orphan. Like he had no reason. He's like, okay, like, Mama Delphine, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. Why not? And so he stuck for a year and he built it. He built this whole thing. And it's called Better Me Kenny. And his whole thing was like, look, if I can produce a better me and I can really look inside of myself and look at my shortcomings and why like I don't do things and why I do do things and dig deeper and start to really analyze my thought process or my mind, why my mind or emotions take me a certain way, then then I can see the world differently. And so what he did was he's like, I'm going to do something that I would never have done before. And I'm going to help this lady who I don't know, build her or orphanages. And he did it. And it became a really great project. And people from all over the world now come visit. They spend a week there. They host these, you know, foreigners. They help the kids out. A lot of these kids have HIV. They're born, you know, in this dire situation. And um, so I would encourage people to to reflect on their thoughts and their processes and where they came from and to dissect them and ask themselves, is this a correct thought? Is this a correct feeling? Like, where did this come from? And, and what's the logic behind it? And by asking yourself these own questions, you start to, you start to hopefully create a better, better you and understanding cool. of yourself. And tell us a little bit about, you know, the time in, in Africa that you found that there are some misconceptions about the continent of Africa and the African people. Now, you and I, that maybe you've traveled, we've traveled, we understand it's much more than what we are hearing at a surface level. It is so rich. It is so diverse. It's just so much about Africa that you can sit around the table and just talk for 
I mean years, about the culture, the people, the heritage. What was it that changed for you in terms of your perception being raised in America and the way we might have understood what Africa meant? You know, by being there and living there, what has shifted for you in your interpretation of Africa, the continent, and the African people? For me, it was that, you know, they weren't just individuals doing dances and the women were half naked. I remember growing up, one of the images that we used to always see were, you know, the mothers and, you know, the cultural image of them, you know, what we would call in America half naked. You know, mm -hmm. over there it might be something different and scars or marks on the face, which seemed very um, naturistic. And it's like that's the images that mass media portrayed many times in Africa. It didn't show the educated ones much. It didn't show the strengths. It didn't show the roots. It didn't show the deep culture of the people. And it wasn't until I really befriended so many that I began to recognize even more the value and the worth of the people. What was it for you? You know, I, I made my first trip to Africa um, right after SARS, so 2001. And I, it was a very quick one to South Africa and Zambia. So I had a little bit of kind of thoughts about it. And New South Africa was a beautiful place, um, though quite divided. Um, the things that we get in America, um, and I don't know why the media does this. And luckily with Anthony Bourdain and some of these great travel shows now, people are really starting to wake up to things. Um, but we get tossed a lot of the nonprofit stuff or give money and help these people out or make yourself feel better and go do this. And that's precisely what people there don't want. They don't want that. Like they, they just don't want all this handouts. And I had several times it's like, you know, America, keep your money. Like we don't, we don't want it. Right. You know? Um, and, and Africa does have its challenges, certainly. Um, but it also has an amazing amount of opportunity in certain areas where they're building a lot of companies now. They're really kind of, uh, you know, far ahead of the game and trying to do things like mobile payments and um, especially in Kenya. Uh, they're trying to do a lot of solar power, renewable energy stuff. I mean, I was in, I was in the refugee camps and they're all talking about renewable energy. And there are more people talking about renewable energy I love that. Refugee <laughs> than they are in the United States of America. I like I was like, Kurt. All, everyone, the, like the lady down the road, I have my solar power pot. And I'm like, where can I get one of those? Like, so the, but the, I think the one, if, so with all of that, and, and I think Silicon Valley does a good job in rebuking a lot of this stuff and saying, you know, they're bringing in Africans now, all like companies after company after company, and you know, Stripe, this, this, $200 billion company just bought a big Africa, you know, start. They're saying, look, Africa is the next wave. This is the last continent, really. And so they're looking that way. Uh, so it's a great time if you want to play the geography game to kind of go out there. But I would say from the people wise, like two or three things came up and I'll just keep it really simple. One is they're very community focused. They're really, they really kind of, they're with each other. They talk to each other a lot. They try to take care of each other. They're in and out of each other's homes very easily. A lot of open doors in Africa. Like, like it was so nice and you don't get that. You know, it's, you, you walk at somebody's door, you might get shot in Tennessee. Um, well, you know, mom, Kurt, hey. I have to tell you, I mean, what do you do when your land and your people have been so abused for so long and kind of left you know, just left there with whatever is left over. You know, they've taken so much of your minerals and riches and took taken it out and foreigners have come in, have taken control of you. And the people have to kind of find a way, well, who are we? And yeah. I think maybe one of the things that Africa and many other nations too are trying to answer is this question, who am I, who are we? And I think until they get to the core of their virtues, and their inner strengths and their beauty and their divinity. They can shrug off, you know, all the atrocities and just say, okay, how did this make us stronger people?
But you know, when you're in systems where people at the top are have designed it in a way that you have to do this a hundred times more than an average person to just get by, it's a little bit of a challenge, I have to say. But if they do keep coming together, like you say, they are a community-based culture, there's nothing that can hold back a bunch of people who work together with vision. Mm. You know, what, um, what would you say, h how have you changed as a result of your experience and time and relationship now to your brothers and sisters halfway across the world in a country that has donated so much of its resources to the rest of the entire world? How has your relationship to Africa and the people inspired and changed you as a soul? Mm. It, certainly to be uh, more empathetic to, to the plight of others, especially as you mentioned, a lot of things people don't control that influence their lives, like, and, you, you know, unfairly, you know, and uh, so when you look at others, when I look at others in, in the US, I always say, how has life influenced them? How, when, how were they born into what, what circumstances did they go through? What things didn't allow them to, uh, you know, mature into living the life they want or things like that. So I think empathy is, is one thing that really, uh, I also try to do a little bit, a lot more community. I try to, I try to like where I am, I try to kind of understand the community a little bit better and just be more community focused and do little things that, you know, don't tr translate into, uh, you know, success, you know, business success. It's like, these people are in trouble. These people are in need. Let's help. Let's just help. Like no reason to, they need help because their lives and souls, they haven't had the opportunity that a white man has had, um, in, in my, you know, situation. I want to, you know, let's get them to a point where they can, and we're doing that in, in Knoxville actually, where there's um, a lot of shootings. Now we're trying to build safe havens and school, little school programs and stuff like that for these kids who are going through a lot of shooting programs. So those are the two big things that I actually thank Africa for. So I would Kurt Davis, thank you for thank you for being a part of the shift in our consciousness about the role that sometimes a white man plays with certain other cultures. Thank you for revealing and showing us that there are so many like you that don't care about the color of the skin. You just care about the content of the heart of a person and how you show up to make a difference. So you are actually leading a whole shift of the narrative in terms of how sometimes people, you know, you know, kind of understand a certain dimension of folks. And I think that's, that's noble. You might not know you're doing it and I'm sure you don't know no, that no, you're no. carrying. I know. Your yeah, you I've learned so much know. from you. I can only you know, <laughs> the, the little discussions. I'm talking too much. Yeah, <laughs> like no, to hear, you don't yeah. even know that you're carrying a legacy of transforming the interpretation that people sometimes hold for those of the Caucasian tradition, because there's been so much in the last four or five years, especially heightened, that you are a positive, beautiful example that we're all like that. We don't look at everybody like that, and so. Thank you for that, and we love you for that. Um, what's 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 happening now with you and for you internally? What's what's been a big aha for you? I think the biggest aha that the the pandemic has created in some ways is that uh, sitting still is a good thing, and and not that meditation didn't teach me that, and actually help me but actually just being and living and and just sitting still and being with family is just fine it's okay and and uh some days i have a hard time because i'm ultra i like to do things and maybe too much and and so that's actually allowed me to do some of this artistic work where i'm writing i'm writing finishing my second book now um and that'll be out in the fall and um 
that's the biggest aha moment. I have to continue. You know, it's okay. Like, this is just fine. And uh, it, you're working. Your your uh, what you're doing has a focus, a lens on helping others and sharing your experiences. And and let's see where that takes takes you. And let's not uh, have expectations and big goals. Okay. Let's just do what you love, and let's see where it goes. Let's just um, trust me. I know how you feel. <laughs> Yeah. I'm ultra, let's go forward to, and for the last two months or so, because we've relocated to a new property, and um, I've, for the first time, just found myself slowing down and looking and taking time, but I have to tell you, it's not for me. For me, I feel like my life is driven, and it's an inspiring life, and I am born to create. I am born to envision. I'm born to move the story forward, and I am okay with that. Mm. The other day, my producer says, you know, you're always so fast, you have to slow. I was about to strangle her, Kurt, when she said that to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean I'm too fast? I'm efficient. There's a difference between fast and efficient. <laughs> <laughs> and then she had the audacity to tell me, Oh, well, you know, sometimes if you go too fast, you make mistakes. I go, look, I've been, been around too many slow people who always make mistakes. Give me fast anytime. <laughs> Give me yeah. fast anytime. So, you know what? Thank you so much for joining us on air and being so genuine, authentic, so um, real. It's I, one of the things I've really appreciated, and I've often thought, Every one of my encounters are pretty genuine and sincere. They've even gotten more so mm. since the pandemic. I've really wanted more to talk to even the deeper part of souls, to build that bond with them throughout time, that even if we meet each other in 10 lifetimes from now, we'll remember each other mm. because of that soul bond, you know. So what's that like book that. that you're working on before we get close? Can I get a sneak preview on what you're up to with that? Sure. It's probably not as relevant here, but I, so I actually, what I did in Africa when I was teaching at the entrepreneurship centers, I realized there was a gap in the ability for a lot of these entrepreneurs to sell, to like really do, you know, this, it's not a natural trait, I guess, uh, for a lot of these entrepreneurs. So I took everything I learned during that decade in Silicon Valley, and I built a PowerPoint presentation for them. And I took that as the basis of all the teaching that I did to teach us to learn as, you know, and took all that, that, all that stuff. And I took as the foundation and wrote a book about the journey of that 10 years and how we went from working on very small sales deals to closing deals with Google, Apple, Microsoft, and these big companies, took all of that knowledge, put it in a book, had 20 contributors. And now we're going to publish that for all the entrepreneurs out there and, salespeople who are trying to learn how to grow their businesses. And um, uh, so sharing that knowledge. And that's also thankful to the Africans because uh, the, several of them asked me to write a book for them. So I said, okay. And that was actually another, another thing that came out of Africa. Uh, without that trip, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have seen the need. So Can't wait to see it. Kurt Davis, thank you for joining us. Is there a website or any you know, last comments that you'd like to share? Uh, sure. Uh, you can follow me. I have a free newsletter I send out every week or two called Katie Alive. And that's uh, about kind of some of my well-being ideas uh, uh, combined with everyday life and things like that and um, uh, some travel things. And uh, I would say, uh, you know, we're, as you said, we're in a new golden age. And uh, I hope everyone uh, uh, musters up and does their part. And because uh, uh, I certainly think uh, with a US focus, we need a lot more community and a lot more empathy uh, or we're gonna struggle, I think, uh, as a country. For saying that, it's true. Can you imagine if each person just steps up and offers their gifts more and more as a seva, as a service? there would be no more poverty, no more violence, no more insecurity. I'm looking forward to that golden age of day to approach, Kurt. I can't tell you. I'm really looking forward to that day. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. But I think uh, 
it's our, our jobs to keep the narrative moving. And so I'm inspired by you. And so I will, I will keep driving forward. So. Thank you. You're a blessing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So everyone, I hope you've enjoyed my conversation and chit chat with Kurt Davis. Please check him out and whatever you can offer in terms of assisting in his organization, Kukum. I think that was something that we didn't go too deep into, but I'm sure it has uh, Kakuma, Kakuma Ventures, Kakuma Ventures. So um, be curious about the work that he's doing. Um, you never know where your call is, where your part of service will be in the world. And you never know, you just never know, but answer whatever that deep feeling is emerging in you and trying to tell you to be of service and to help others, all right? So thank you so much for joining us today on The Next Normal and America Meditating Radio. Remember, no one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission, and we really are here to love each other the same. Many good wishes. Take care, everyone.